Hey guys, today I'll show you a science fiction thriller TV series named The Man in the High Castle, Season 1. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins in an alternate world where the Axis powers, primarily Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan, emerged victorious in World War II. In this narrative, Germany and Japan have divided the United States between them. Germany controls the eastern part, known as the Greater Nazi Reich, while Japan governs the western part, called the Japanese Pacific States. The man, Joe, is introduced while he is watching a Daniel C.C. movie. During the screening, a person next to him hands him a card with an address. Following the address, Joe later finds a factory, which turns out to be a base for the resistance movement in New York City. It turns out this group opposes the Japanese and German regimes and aims to restore the United States and make it great again. Joe meets the resistance's local leader, who provides him with a map and a handgun, instructing him to drive a truck to Cannon City, a neutral zone, to deliver a coffee machine. He assures Joe that someone will contact him once he reaches safety. However, just as Joe is about to depart, a group of Nazi soldiers arrives. The leader urges Joe to leave immediately and prioritize the delivery. Despite Joe's efforts to help, managing to kill one of the soldiers, the resistance leader is captured by the Nazis. In the ensuing chaos, Joe escapes with the truck, but the Nazis annihilate the resistance base. The scene shifts to the Japanese-occupied San Francisco, where a girl named Juliana is practicing Aikido when a young Japanese man approaches her, complimenting her necklace. Juliana replies that it was a gift from her boyfriend. Despite learning about her boyfriend, the Japanese man insists on inviting her for tea, and Juliana reluctantly agrees to meet before her class the next day. Later, Juliana visits a traditional medicine shop to buy remedies for her mother's arthritis. At that moment, her half-sister, Trudy, rushes in, briefly greets Juliana and attempts to leave. Juliana grabs her and asks what's going on. Trudy cryptically mentions discovering a secret and promises to explain later before hurrying away, leaving Juliana puzzled. Juliana then heads to her mother's house to prepare the medicine. Her mother is baffled by Juliana's affinity for the Japanese, especially since Juliana's father was killed by them during the war. After a brief defense, Juliana drops the subject. Juliana and her boyfriend, Frank, meet at a bar. Juliana notices an unfinished painting by Frank and praises his artistic skills, suggesting he sell his work. However, Frank explains that since the Axis powers won the war, they deem modern art degenerate. Their conversation shifts to marriage and children, but both express concerns, particularly because Frank's ancestry includes Jewish heritage. They fear the repercussions in a world where Jews are persecuted and killed. At this point, Frank's co-worker Ed joins them, commenting on Hitler's trembling hand seen on TV. He reveals that the Nazi leader Hitler has Parkinson's disease and is expected to live no more than six months. This raises the possibility that Himmler, a powerful politician in Nazi Germany, will take over, and they might use atomic bombs to obliterate the entire West Coast, which is now occupied by Imperial Japan. On her way home, Juliana once again encountered her sister who was visibly distressed. Trudy handed Juliana a leather bag, saying it was their way out. Tragically, Trudy was killed by Japanese soldiers on a street corner shortly after. Back home, Juliana opened the bag and found a videotape inside. She played the tape and was deeply engrossed and astounded by what she saw. The footage depicted an alternate reality where the United States had won World War II. Berlin had been captured, and the Japanese emperor was seen signing a surrender document. Both Axis powers were defeated. When Frank returned, he saw Juliana in tears like a giant baby. He remarked that a film producer known as The Man in the High Castle was believed for making anti-fascist films, but Juliana insisted that the footage was too real to be fake. Frank then attempted to destroy the tape, knowing that possessing such a film was considered treason. He asked who had given her the tape, and Juliana explained it was her sister Trudy, who had been killed by the Japanese soldiers. Frank suggested they should report it to the authorities to distance themselves from Trudy and prove their loyalty. Juliana, however, pointed out that the police were the ones who killed her sister. Juliana discovered a ticket to Cannon City in the bag, with Sunrise Diner written on the back. Frank wanted to take Juliana to the police station, but she insisted that this was too serious and hoped Frank would stay out of it as much as possible. She decided to go alone, leaving behind the necklace Frank had given her. She took the tape and left. Outside, she ran into the Japanese man who had asked her for tea. Juliana claimed she had another appointment. When the man noticed the tape in her bag, Juliana became wary and quickly left. 
Meanwhile, at the German embassy, Japanese and German officials discussed the upcoming visit of the Japanese crown prince and princess. On the surface, both sides appeared cordial and cooperative. However, once the Japanese trade minister, Tagomi, left, the Germans showed disdain, questioning why their leader allowed the Japanese to control the western half of the continent. In the elevator, Tagomi expressed concern about Hitler's severe illness. If Hitler were to die, his successor might wage war on Japan, a conflict Japan would likely lose. In a New York City prison, Nazi soldiers were interrogating the local leader of the resistance organization. John, the Nazi deputy commander, entered the scene. Despite the torture, the man refused to divulge any information. John insisted on continuing until the man talked, even if it meant beating him to death. It turned out John already knew the truck's destination and cargo. Killing the resistance leader was meant to create the illusion that he died without revealing any information. Elsewhere, Joe had to pull over because of a flat tire. Fortunately, a kind policeman stopped to help him fix it and even shared a sandwich his wife had made. Suddenly, ashes began to fall from the sky. The policeman explained they were from the hospital, where they burned cripples and terminally ill patients every Tuesday, deeming them burdens on the state. Later, Joe found a tape titled, Heavy Ant, under the truck. After showing his documents to the checkpoint soldiers, he was able to pass through without any issues. The scene shifts to Juliana arriving at the train station. It turns out she didn't go to the police station. As soon as she enters, a stranger approaches her, asking how she got the bag since this bag was given to Trudy by him. Juliana replies that she's Trudy's sister and Trudy is dead. The stranger wants to take the bag to complete the mission, but Juliana refuses, insisting on doing it herself to honor her sister. The man reluctantly agrees, and Juliana boards a bus headed to Cannon City. As Juliana gets closer to Cannon City, an elderly woman sits next to her and starts explaining the situation in the neutral zone. She mentions that it's lawless and that Nazi agents are actively capturing enemies of the Reich. Juliana eventually falls asleep on the bus. Upon waking up, she discovers her bag is missing and suspects the elderly woman took it. Fortunately, the videotape is still with her. Meanwhile, Tagomi is at the airport welcoming Colonel Rudolph from Germany. Tagomi praises German technology, remarking that the journey from New York to San Francisco takes less than two hours, something Japan can't match. He then inquires about the situation in Berlin. Rudolf responds that Hitler's health is failing and that Himmler are vying for power. Tagomi knows that neither of them seeks peace and that both believe dividing America was a grave mistake. If Hitler dies, they might launch another nuclear attack, with San Francisco likely being the first target. The next morning, Juliana arrives in Cannon City and finds the Sunrise Diner. At the same time, police visit Frank's home to inquire about Juliana. During their conversation, the phone rings. It's Juliana calling. Her boyfriend, Frank, filled with anxiety, hesitates, but Juliana hangs up before he can answer. At the diner, Juliana orders some food, but when she goes to pay, she realizes she has no money. Just then, Joe steps in to help and they introduce themselves. Juliana uses her sister Trudy's name instead of her own. While they chat, significant events unfold elsewhere. The resistance leader's body is found dumped on the street, and both Frank and the resistance member who spoke to Juliana at the train station are arrested. Joe then remembers he has work to report and goes to a public phone booth. On the other end of the call is Deputy Commander John, revealing that Joe is actually a Nazi agent, indicating there's a mole within the resistance. Afterward, Frank is taken to a Japanese prison and brutally beaten. His interrogator, Inspector Kido, demands to know where Juliana took the videotape. When Frank remains silent, Kido threatens him by revealing that Frank's entire family, including his sister and her children, are Jewish, a fact that could lead to their extermination. Kido offers to overlook this if Frank reveals Juliana's whereabouts. Juliana, unable to sleep, spends the night with Joe at a dam. Neither of them mentions the videotape during their conversation. Back in town, Juliana sees a recruitment sign at the Sunrise Diner and applies for a job to solve her money problems. While working, she notices a man with glasses and reading a Bible. She strikes up a conversation, mentioning that reading the Bible is illegal in Nazi and Japanese territories, so she's never read it. As the man pays his bill, he quotes Matthew 12:5 and gives Juliana money to buy a Bible for herself. At this point, Juliana suspects the man might be her contact on Trudy's mission. Commander John received a call from his informant Joe at home. From their previous conversations, it was clear that Joe was a Nazi undercover agent within the resistance organization. John informed him that the courier coming from San Francisco was a woman and instructed him to report immediately if he encountered her. Joe then realized that Juliana was the woman who had just arrived from San Francisco and began inquiring about the videotape. 
However, John warned Joe not to ask too many questions and to simply follow orders. After breakfast, John was on his way to the government office building, discussing the films with his deputy. The deputy mentioned that those films could undermine the foundations of the state. Suddenly, they were attacked by resistance fighters. They exchanged bullets rather than kisses. In the end, the deputy was shot and severely injured. John jumped out of the car and fought back against the attackers. Thanks to his formidable combat skills, he survived the ambush and captured one of the surviving resistance members. John was puzzled as he changed his route daily, yet they were still ambushed. He vowed to get to the bottom of it. Meanwhile, Frank's co-worker Ed noticed that Frank hadn't taken leave and hadn't shown up for work. Worried, he tried calling Frank but got no answer, so he decided to go look for him. In prison, Frank discovered that the cellmate next to him was the one who had given the videotape to Trudy. The cellmate explained that the film depicted a possible alternate reality. Frank argued that in their reality, Washington had been flattened by an atomic bomb, and a film could never change that. He believed the resistance was too weak to defeat Japan and Germany. On the other side, during a break, Juliana went to a bookstore and bought a Bible. She read the chapter the man with glasses had mentioned and found a passage referring to grasshoppers becoming a burden, which connected with the title of the videotape. This convinced her that the man was indeed the contact at the Sunrise Diner. Shortly after, Joe also came to the bookstore to buy a book and casually asked the owner about Juliana, who had just been there. The owner claimed not to know her. At the hotel, Joe saw Juliana talking to the man with glasses again. He then called John to report the suspicious person and described the man's appearance to him. Just as Juliana decided to meet the contact at the diner, she approached Joe and handed him a letter, asking him to send it to her family in San Francisco if she didn't return. Joe agreed, but as soon as Juliana left the room, he opened the envelope and discovered her identity and the details about the videotape. At the Japanese police station, Inspector Kido brought in Frank's sister and her children, took a photo of them, and sent it to Frank. He then locked them in a dark room, threatening to kill them with poison gas if Frank did not reveal Juliana's whereabouts. After a while, two Japanese guards took the resistance cellmate away and executed him. Kido then returned to interrogate Frank further about Juliana's location. Frank, however, remained silent and pleaded to be killed instead. Meanwhile, after reading the letter, Joe sneaked into a theater to watch the videotape from Juliana. The footage showing an alternate history left him deeply shocked and unsettled, clearly affecting his beliefs. At that moment, John called, informing Joe that the person he had described was a high-ranking Nazi agent who had eliminated many rebels and warned Joe to stay away from him. Joe then rushed to find Juliana, who was meeting the man at the dam. When the man took the reel and attempted to kill Juliana, Joe arrived just in time. Juliana used her Aikido skills to throw the man off the dam, and she and Joe left the scene. However, in their haste, Juliana accidentally dropped the drawing Frank had given her. Back at the prison, Frank was also taken away by the Japanese, prepared for execution. Poison gas was released into the room where his sister and her children were held. Just then, the Japanese captured the elderly woman who had stolen Juliana's bag. They found the videotapes in her possession, but they were fake newsreels, not the one Juliana had. This proved Juliana's innocence and Frank was released. Outside, he was met by Ed. Frank asked about his sister and her children. Kiddo coldly told him that it was too late by the time they discovered the truth, and his sister and her children had already been killed by the gas. As Frank was allowed to leave, he furiously told Kido if he wanted to kill more Jews, he knew where to find him. Juliana and Joe returned to the hotel. She was still struggling to come to terms with the fact that she had killed someone. It was clear that this was Juliana's first time taking a life. Joe tried to comfort her using his words only but not muscles yet, sharing his own experiences of killing and mentioning that the man with glasses might have been a Nazi agent. He urged her that they needed to leave quickly. The next morning, Juliana realized that her drawing was missing. Joe once again insisted on leaving immediately, but Juliana suggested they leave gradually to avoid raising suspicion. She told Joe to go first while she would stay until after lunch before meeting him. Frank returned home feeling deeply guilty about the deaths of his sister and her children. The next day, his co-worker Ed brought him a letter stating that, as enemies of the state, his sister and her children were not entitled to a burial and would be cremated within the next seven to ten days. Heartbroken, Frank's hands trembled so much that he couldn't even light a cigarette. On a street TV, Frank saw the Japanese crown prince and princess arriving, the broadcast showing a scene of prosperity which starkly contrasted with his own bleak reality. It was evident that Frank had no heart left to work. In New York, John was still puzzled about how the resistance knew his travel routes. 
Just then, Joe called, saying that the contact still hadn't met him. John suspected the contact wouldn't show up and told Joe to come back. Afterward, Frank received a call from Juliana. She told him she missed him, but Frank couldn't bring himself to face her, knowing that her actions were indirectly related to his family's deaths. Meanwhile, as Joe was refueling a truck, a man in a hat approached him and demanded to see his papers. Joe was reluctant, but the man pulled out a gun, forcing Joe to comply. The man then showed a photo of the man with glasses and asked the store attendant if they recognized him. The attendant mentioned seeing the man with glasses at a bookstore. Hearing this, Joe hurried to the diner to warn Juliana again, urging her to leave quickly, but to deal with the man with glasses' body first. The man in the hat followed the lead to the bookstore and questioned the owner about Juliana. Realizing the man was dangerous, the owner gave him Juliana's information. As the man was about to leave, he paused and pulled out a deck of cards with photos of wanted individuals. One of the cards featured the bookstore owner. The man in the hat identified him as the wanted person from Ohio, who had escaped from a concentration camp near New Berlin in 1954. The owner denied being that person, but the man insisted he was. The man then killed the bookstore owner and hung his body in the town square, warning everyone not to take it down. Juliana and Joe went to the base of the dam and disposed of the man with Glasses' body. At the Nazi embassy, German and Japanese officials welcomed the Japanese crown prince and princess. The crown prince looked anything but pleased, aware that it was all a political charade, even his marriage to the princess. He noted that while he traveled from Japan to San Francisco by passenger ship, the Germans traveled by rocket, highlighting the vast technological gap between the two nations. He knew that Japan, being just an island nation, would gradually lose control over its colonies, whereas the Nazi regime continued to solidify its dominance. At the banquet, Tagomi and Rudolf from Germany were conversing about the Japanese Minister of Technology. It seemed like they were plotting something for the two nations. Cut to Frank, who was drinking alone at a bar. A woman sat next to him, and although Frank had no intention of talking, she mentioned his recent experiences. This made Frank realize that she was also a member of the resistance. Frank, however, wanted nothing to do with the organization, believing they were responsible for his family's deaths, and he left in sorrow. Elsewhere, the man in the hat was stopped by a blonde boy on the street. The boy offered to reveal the man with glasses whereabouts in exchange for two marks. Unaware that the man in the hat was dangerous, the boy was quickly pinned down. He then revealed that the man with glasses had driven towards the dam late at night. After tracing to the dam, the man in the hat found Juliana's missing drawing. Just as Juliana and Joe were preparing to leave Cannon City, Juliana discovered a map in the man with glasses car. The map pointed to a mine, which Juliana decided to investigate. Later at the mine, she found a chained corpse and a note listing the names of resistance members. It's now clear that the man with glasses had been hunting down these people, crossing off each name after killing them. The list included names of her sister Trudy and the diner owner Lemuel. It turned out that Lemuel was a member of the resistance and the contact Juliana had been searching for. In New York, John interrogated the resistance member about who had leaked his travel itinerary. The resistance member claimed it was one of John's subordinates. John called in the subordinate, pointing a gun at the back of his head. The subordinate insisted he was innocent and framed. John pulled the trigger, but the gun was empty, proving the subordinate's innocence. This was John's usual interrogation method, believing that people only tell the truth when facing death. Nonetheless, John still didn't know who the mole sent by the resistance was. Frank's brother-in-law came to the house, blaming Frank's girlfriend for his wife and children's deaths and resenting Frank for not revealing information. He also deeply tormented himself. After he left, Frank heard the Crown Prince's itinerary on TV. His hatred for the Japanese had reached its peak. Frank went to the factory, not to work, but to make a gun ready for his revenge. Juliana and Joe returned to Cannon City, planning to find the diner owner, Lemuel. On their way, they saw the bookstore owner's body hanging. Just then, the man in the hat blocked their path with his car and opened fire. In the chaos, Juliana jumped out of the car and ran. The man in the hat pursued her with a gun, tracing her smell. Just as he was about to catch her, Joe arrived in time and struck him from behind. But when they got outside, they found the truck was gone. They had no choice but to hide in another house. The man in the hat soon caught up again, flexing his sweaty hat. He spotted the blonde boy on the street and asked where they went. The boy pointed in the wrong direction, and the man in the hat drove off that way. Juliana then realized the boy was helping them. She and Joe asked the boy why he helped, and he replied that the guy was crazy. Why else would he help? They then asked where Lemuel lived. 
Following the boy's directions, they soon found Lemuel's house. Lemuel was very cautious, letting only Juliana inside while Joe waited outside. Juliana told Lemuel about the videotape and what happened at the mine. Lemuel explained that he hadn't revealed his identity back then because he didn't trust her and he trusted Joe even less. He then demanded the videotape. Juliana insisted on delivering it to Lemuel's superior herself, explaining that her sister died because of it and she needed to get to the bottom of things. After leaving, Juliana told Joe the meeting location and that the person they were meeting was the film producer, the man in the high castle. Joe, realizing the gravity of the situation, called his superior John and informed him that he might meet the man in the high castle. John instructed Joe not to bring the videotape to the man in the high castle and to kill him at all costs, even if it meant sacrificing himself. John promised Joe a hero's burial if he succeeded. Meanwhile, Frank was at home practicing shooting and familiarizing himself with the Crown Prince's speech venue. Ed visited and asked Frank what he planned to do with the gun. Frank said it was for self-defense, but Ed noticed a newspaper with the Crown Prince's photo, realizing Frank intended to assassinate him. Ed warned Frank that his life would be over if he went through with it. Consumed by hatred, Frank ignored Ed's bullshit. Ed pleaded with Frank not to do anything foolish, and Frank finally agreed, promising to discard the gun. The scene shifts to the crown princess, summoning the trade minister Tagomi. She mentioned the crown prince was deeply troubled, fearing Japan was losing control. The generals wanted the crown prince to take a strong stance in his upcoming speech to deter the Nazis from coveting Japanese territory. Tagomi remarked that a weak nation invites aggression, but some forces might still push for peace. The next day, Colonel Rudolf from Germany placed a capsule containing a microfilm in an envelope. Tagomi arrived saying he had arranged for Rudolf to sit next to the Minister of Technology. During the Crown Prince's speech, Rudolf was to slip the envelope into the Minister's pocket. On the other side, Juliana and Joe were preparing to meet the said producer. After Juliana got out of the car, Joe hesitated, but ultimately decided to bring the videotape. When they arrived at the meeting spot, several armed men emerged and forcibly took the videotape from Juliana. They then mentioned that Joe's division had been attacked by the Nazi SS just as he was leaving. This coincidence made them suspect Joe was a Nazi mole, intending to kill both of them. Joe quickly claimed he also had a videotape in his bag, arguing that if he were a Nazi spy, he wouldn't be carrying such evidence. Lemuel believed him and let them go. Frank ignored Ed's advice and went to an antique shop to buy bullets. His vintage gun required specific ammo available only there. The shopkeeper initially refused to sell the bullets because dealing in ammunition was regulated and selling to non-Japanese customers was illegal here. However, when Frank produced a wad of cash, the shopkeeper changed his tune. Two Japanese customers entered and the shopkeeper immediately fawned over them. Frank insisted on being served first and the Japanese customers left. Afterward, the shopkeeper gave Frank three bullets, using a Japanese name for the transaction. In New York, John still hadn't identified the mole. His subordinates had only located the assassin's two brothers, one in the neutral zone and one in Japan. John decided to visit the assassin, but by the time he arrived, the man had killed himself with a spoon. The guard noted that no spoon had been provided with the meal, indicating an inside job. Meanwhile, Frank loaded his gun, preparing to assassinate the crown prince. Ed stormed in and, seizing a moment of distraction, took the gun from Frank, pointing it at him. Ed insisted that attempting to kill the crown prince was suicide and demanded Frank stay put until the speech was over. Frank tried to reclaim the gun, but Ed accidentally fired, hitting Frank's arm. As Frank sent Ed to fetch the first aid kit, he locked Ed inside the house and left. In Cannon City, the man in the hat encountered Juliana as she was getting into a car. When he tried to pursue her following her smell, Joe blocked his way with a truck. Joe claimed to be a Nazi, working on the same mission as the man in the hat, and that he reported directly to Deputy Commander John. The man in the hat didn't believe his nonsense and still chased after Juliana. Along the way, he found Juliana's wrecked car with a charred body inside. Unbeknownst to him, the body was from the mine, and Juliana had staged the scene to make him think she was dead as shit. At the speech venue, Colonel Rudolph smoothly entered the hall. However, the Japanese Minister of Technology's seat was suddenly relocated. Seeing this, Rudolph had no choice but to sit behind the minister. Meanwhile, Juliana and Joe managed to shake off the man in the hat. Joe offered to take Juliana back to San Francisco, but Juliana was determined to understand everything and had no intention of going home. She then called Frank, but Ed answered the phone. Ed revealed that Frank planned to assassinate the Crown Prince, leaving Juliana with no choice but to return. She boarded the bus home. 
Frank also arrived at the speech venue and Rudolph prepared to hand the envelope to the minister. Just as Frank drew his gun, two shots suddenly rang out. The Japanese crown prince was critically wounded, but the shooter wasn't Frank. The scene descended into chaos, and Frank hurriedly fled for his shitty life, accidentally dropping Juliana's necklace. Due to the sudden chaos, Rudolph failed to pass the capsule to the minister. The authorities began a manhunt for the assassin. Frank found an opportunity to hide his gun in a concealed spot. The Japanese military started checking the IDs of everyone at the scene. Seeing this, Rudolph swallowed the capsule to avoid being caught, but his passport was still confiscated. Tagomi noticed Frank's dropped necklace and picked it up. Frank returned home in a panic. Ed, thinking Frank was the shooter, confronted him. Frank insisted it wasn't him and that someone else had done it. Juliana arrived home and saw her boyfriend. She felt guilty upon seeing his injuries and tried to hug him, but Frank rejected her soft muscles. Clearly, he still resented her for leaving without a word. At the hospital, doctors managed to remove all the shrapnel, but the crown prince's condition remained critical. The doctors said his fate was uncertain. Back at her mother's house, Juliana learned about the ordeal Frank's family had gone through. She was shocked and realized how much her sudden departure had hurt Frank and his family. Her mother then asked about Juliana's sister. Unable to reveal her sister's death, Juliana vaguely replied that she hadn't been in touch with Trudy for a long time. She then rushed to Frank's house and hugged him, ready for a smelly hormone yoga session. Frank recounted the recent events to Juliana. As Juliana tended to his wounds, she expressed regret for boarding that bus. Afterward, Frank prepared to go to work. Juliana asked if they could ever go back to the way things were, but Frank said it was impossible and that he only wanted to survive each day now. Elsewhere, Tagomi visited Rudolph's place and found it under Japanese surveillance. Rudolph, whose fake passport had been confiscated, was worried about being caught by the Japanese government. Tagomi was more concerned about the microfilm and asked where it was. Rudolph said he had swallowed it, which reassured Tagomi. Rudolph wanted to complete his mission, but Tagomi insisted on getting him safely out of San Francisco. Tagomi feared that if Rudolph was captured by the Nazis, he would be tortured to death. Despite this, Rudolph was determined to try again, determined to secretly deliver the microfilm to Japan's technology minister. Tagomi mentioned a bus to New York that night, which would be Rudolph's last chance and would also retrieve a fake Swedish passport. It turned out both Tagomi and Rudolph were peace advocates. They knew the growing technological and military gap between Germany and Japan would lead to war. That's why Rudolph risked his life to give advanced German technology to the Japanese Minister of Technology, so as to maintain technological parity and peace between the two powers. Joe also returned to New York. As soon as he got off the bus, he was bagged and dragged to John's office. The Major explained that they had to capture Joe this way to protect his cover. He questioned Joe about recent events, and Joe answered truthfully, though he didn't mention Juliana. John then entered and brought up Juliana. Joe claimed she had died in the accident and believed his mission wasn't a failure. John then invited Joe to spend the holidays with his family. On the streets, Inspector Kido was still organizing the search for the assassin. He saw the security captain, who had failed to protect the crown prince, end his own life. Speaking to his men, Kido said if they didn't find the shooter in time, they would also have to end their own lives. Turning to Juliana, she went to the dojo, but the head instructor told her she was no longer eligible to train here as a wanted person. Subsequently, Juliana went to the Japanese government building to surrender. The Japanese interrogated her, asking where she had been in the past few days, and then showed her a photo of the captured resistance member she had seen at the train station, who had been killed by the Japanese. They asked if she recognized him, and Juliana denied ever seeing him. After the interrogation, Juliana found the captured resistance member's address in the phone book. She entered his room later, which was already in ruins. There she encountered Karen, the female resistance member who had previously approached Frank in the bar. Karen asked if Juliana had delivered the film successfully. After Juliana responded, she asked why the man in the high castle wanted the videotapes. Karen explained if they delivered the videotapes to him, he could bring them the intelligence against the Japanese. Juliana expressed her desire to continue seeking answers. Karen suggested that Trudy and the dead resistance member might have been set up, as otherwise, the Japanese wouldn't have known about the film. She then pulled a card from her boot, revealing that on the day the resistance member was captured, he had sent this to their mailbox. It was a pass to the Japanese government building, with a name on the back. Karen believed this person might have leaked their plans and mentioned that the building was currently hiring, suggesting it's a good way for infiltrating into the building. However, she warned Juliana that it was a dangerous job and once a decision was made, there would be no turning back. 
On the other side, Tagomi requested Rudolph's passport from Inspector Kido, but he insisted on verifying all foreign arrivals in the Pacific States before returning it. Meanwhile, Rudolph retrieved the microfilm capsule from his residence. He then received a call from Tagomi, who informed him that the guards would change shifts in eight minutes, providing a two-minute window to leave the room. Rudolph then pretended to bump into the Minister of Technology, using the opportunity to slip the capsule into his pocket. Later, Juliana went to the Japanese government building for an interview, but was stopped by Japanese soldiers. She showed her pass, and they let her through. During the interview, she highlighted her various strengths, but the interviewer asked her to stand up, remove her coat, and turn around. He then implied that working there would require providing certain personal services. Feeling his hormone advances, Juliana left in anger. As she exited, she accidentally bumped into the trade minister and recognized the necklace Tagomi dropped. It was the one her boyfriend had given her. She didn't reveal this, picked up the necklace, returned it to Tagomi, and hurried to the exit. Joe was invited to John's home, where he met John's family. John's wife and their three children, along with their dog, gave Joe a glimpse of John's more relaxed and happy home life, in contrast to his stern demeanor at work. While touring the house, Joe discovered a classified file labeled Grasshopper. Just as he was about to open the cabinet and look at it, John's son interrupted, inviting Joe to play baseball. John then approached, saying he needed to pick up his mother-in-law from the airport and ask Joe to accompany him. Juliana returned to the Japanese government building where she was greeted by a subordinate of Tagomi. She was brought to Tagomi's office where she saw her necklace. It turned out that Tagomi had learned about Juliana's situation from the interviewer and was preparing to offer her a reception job. Kido was still investigating the shooter. Based on a witness's description, they learned that the shooter wore glasses and used an antique gun, pointing directly to Frank. Subsequently, Kido visited an antique shop to inquire about recent transactions involving guns and ammunition. He found a record of bullets sold three days ago, but the buyer was registered as a Japanese person living in Tibet. It was clear that the antique shop owner had intentionally recorded false information. While Frank was at home, he was visited by Juliana's stepfather, who was also the biological father of Juliana's half-sister, Trudy. He had noticed Juliana's unease at home and felt she was hiding something from him. Since Trudy hadn't been in contact with the family recently, he was very worried and came to ask Frank if he knew anything. Frank, however, said nothing. John and Joe arrived at the airport, only to find out that the flight carrying John's mother-in-law had been canceled. As they were about to leave, they ran into Rudolph, who had just arrived. John and Rudolph turned out to be old friends who hadn't seen each other in 15 years. Rudolph explained that his connecting flight to Berlin was delayed until the evening. John invited Rudolph to his home, and Rudolph, seeing John's warm invitation, accepted. At John's house, John asked Rudolph about his business in Japan. Rudolph explained it was trade-related. The group then watched Hitler's Victory Day speech. John sent his wife to fetch some snacks, and Joe volunteered to get them, planning to use the opportunity to check the Grasshopper classified file. However, he found the cabinet locked. As Joe searched for the key, John's wife's call interrupted him, so he returned to the TV room with the snacks. Joe then noticed the key was on the table and began thinking about how to obtain it. Joe asked Rudolph about the situation in Japan. After Rudolph responded, John felt that his old friend's admiration for Japan was a bit excessive. Rudolph, however, believed that like Hitler, he only wanted peace between Germany and Japan, which would benefit everyone. A disagreement arose between John and Rudolph. Rudolph criticized Germany for having so many concentration camps and killing so many people, yet still awarding medals to those responsible. John argued that the world was better now than it had been, and that people should look to the future. Sensing the discussion was about to turn into an argument, Joe raised his glass to diffuse the tension. Inspector Kido arrived at the Japanese government building to see Tagomi. He inquired about the sudden disappearance of the Nazi member Rudolf from his hotel the previous day. Tagomi claimed he had no knowledge of the matter. However, Kido found it suspicious that the Crown Prince's assassination coincided with Rudolf's disappearance and expressed his doubts. He then asked Tagomi about a diplomatic visa that had been issued, wanting to know who it was for. Tagomi agreed to provide information on the individual, but assured Kido that it was not Rudolf. Meanwhile, the antique shop owner paid a visit to Frank, informing him that the Japanese had come by asking about guns and bullets. The owner said he didn't care what Frank was up to, as long as the bullets couldn't be traced back to implicate him. Frank, irritated, told the owner to leave, calling him a dog and insisted that they were in this mess together. 
He warned that if he talked, they'd both be in trouble, and the owner had no choice but to trust him. Frank had prepared dinner at home, but Juliana was delayed by some matters and arrived late. She explained that she was dealing with issues related to the films and declared she wouldn't give up until she uncovered the truth. Frank expressed his frustration, saying he used to be happy until she got involved with the films. Juliana retorted that their happiness had always depended on the whims of others and wondered if the films represented a new path forward. Frank felt that Juliana had changed from the person he once knew. Juliana then confided in Frank about her work at the government building and her involvement in a killing. Frank asked whom she had killed and Juliana explained that a Nazi agent had tried to kill her, but someone from the East Coast Resistance had helped her. When Frank asked if the helper was a man, Juliana questioned why it mattered. Frank, feeling betrayed, angrily left, leaving Juliana heartbroken. Elsewhere, John asked Joe about Rudolph's character. Joe described Rudolph as a good man, but John saw through Rudolph's lies. John revealed that Rudolph wasn't in Japan for trade and that his diplomatic credentials were fake. The flight hadn't been delayed. Rudolph simply couldn't leave. John had known this all along and hoped Rudolph would come clean. John and Rudolph had been comrades with a deep bond, and John feared his personal feelings would cloud his judgment. He believed Rudolph, being a good man, must have had a compelling reason to betray his people. John's rational side suggested taking Rudolph to the woods for interrogation and execution, but he couldn't bring himself to do it. As he prepared to let Rudolph go, Nazi soldiers appeared outside. Rudolph turned to John, saying he had always been much smarter than him. Rudolph was then taken away by the soldiers. During her workday, Juliana discovered that rooms in the Japanese government building were named after flowers. She realized that the name on the pass she saw earlier might not be a person's name, but a room's name. She then found the Sakura room and managed to slip inside. It was an intelligence room where various intercepted information was collected. Juliana noticed a section labeled Grasshopper and discreetly placed the relevant papers under the tray to take with her. As she was about to leave, she was shocked to see her stepfather working there. Hastily, she left the room. After Frank left home, he had nowhere to go and ended up at a Jewish friend's house. Meanwhile, Joe took the key from the table, opened the cabinet, and began examining the Grasshopper classified files. To his surprise, all the pages were blank. Suddenly, the lights in the room turned on, and Joe realized he had walked into a trap. John had caught Joe secretly looking through the classified files. Feeling betrayed, John confronted Joe with a picture of Juliana that Joe had brought back, demanding to know who she was. Joe truthfully explained Juliana's situation, but John could see that Joe had developed feelings for her and wanted to protect her. At home, Juliana examined the intelligence she had taken from the Sakura room. The document instructed to place a new gift behind the curtain, leaving Juliana puzzled. At that moment, Frank returned, and in his grief over his sister's death, confessed to Juliana that he had attempted to assassinate the crown prince. Seeing Frank so distraught, Juliana embraced him but without a kiss. The next day, Juliana's stepfather called, informing her that he was going to work and asking her to stay with her mother. Juliana then revealed to Frank that her stepfather worked for the Japanese. Robert, the antique shop owner, received a call from a previous Japanese customer. The Japanese businessman invited him to dinner at his home. Robert assumed the invitation was for a business deal, but the businessman assured him he didn't need to bring anything. Robert felt honored, thinking he had become a friend of the Japanese. John took Joe to the interrogation room. He accused Juliana of being part of the resistance and labeled her a traitor. John told him that if he wanted to protect her, he would be considered a traitor too. John demanded that Joe use Juliana to find the film, promising to overlook everything if he succeeded. If Joe failed, both he and Juliana would die. John then instructed him to call Juliana. When she answered, fearing Frank might misunderstand, she said it wasn't a good time to talk and promised to call back in the evening. As expected, Frank asked if the caller was the East Coast Resistance member. Juliana truthfully answered and assured Frank that nothing was going on between them. Frank believed her. Juliana visited her mother, who expressed a feeling that Trudy was already dead. She recalled having the same feeling when Juliana's biological father had died. Juliana didn't know how to respond or how long she could keep the truth about her sister's death from her mother. When Joe returned home, a child ran up and hugged him. This child was his girlfriend's son. Juliana thought she saw her sister on the street and followed her, but the figure suddenly disappeared. At home, Tagomi was mourning his deceased wife and child. As he looked at their photos, even his normally stoic demeanor broke, and he began to cry. Tagomi later found Inspector Kido waiting for him in his office. 
Kido informed Tagomi that Juliana, whom he had hired, was the sister of a resistance member and that Tagomi would now have to answer for her actions. Juliana overheard this and approached, apologizing for bringing trouble to Tagomi. She offered to resign or be dismissed, but Tagomi, still believing in her character, had no intention of firing her. He remarked that life was too short and filled with too many problems to address them all. He then ordered his men to investigate the whereabouts of Juliana's sister. At the factory, the Japanese authorities arrived again. Seeing them, Frank hurriedly exited through the back, but Kido had already noticed him. Meanwhile, Juliana, delivering documents for Tagomi, encountered her stepfather. She tried to avoid him, but as she left, he recognized her. He asked to meet her at a corner restaurant after work. At the restaurant, he questioned Juliana about her intentions at the government building. Juliana turned the question back on him. Her stepfather explained that he worked for the Japanese to support the family and knew about her involvement with the resistance. He revealed that his job had allowed his superiors to show leniency towards her. Juliana realized that he was unaware of Trudy's death. In the evening, Robert went to the Japanese businessman's house as planned. The businessman and his wife insisted Robert call them by their first names, which delighted him. The host then showed off his collection, including an antique 1860 gun. Robert immediately recognized it as a fake, but couldn't reveal this. Instead, he asked how the host identified authenticity. The businessman boasted about his trained eye, leaving Robert no choice but to continue flattering him. After dinner, Robert invited the host to dine with him the following week, but the host declined, stating he only wanted to learn about American culture, not to become friends or have meals together. Elsewhere, Joe finally received a call from Juliana. He asked if she knew about the new film. Juliana said she didn't know much, but had heard it was different. She ended the call abruptly upon noticing a Japanese person nearby. John, who had been analyzing the call, ordered Joe to go to San Francisco to obtain the film, threatening the life of his girlfriend's son if Joe failed to comply. Frank approached the antique shop owner Robert with a proposal. He wanted to use his craftsmanship to create forgeries that Robert could sell, splitting the profits 50-50. Robert agreed, enticed by the prospect of making money, especially from what he perceived as the unsuspecting Japanese buyers. He handed Frank a design to replicate and sell to the Japanese. When Juliana returned home, she told Frank she thought she had seen her sister, Trudy. Frank, however, reminded her that she had witnessed the Japanese shooting Trudy, making it impossible for her to be alive. He also mentioned that the Japanese had come to the factory again, expressing his fear of being caught and implicating Juliana. They decided they needed to leave together. The next day at work, Tagomi informed Juliana that Trudy was indeed dead and provided the location of her body along with a bouquet of flowers, asking Juliana to seek forgiveness on their behalf. Juliana, overwhelmed, left work immediately and went to the given location, which turned out to be a mass grave. She quickly recognized Trudy's body, finally accepting her sister's death. Wandering aimlessly through the city, Juliana was unaware that Joe had arrived in San Francisco and was following her. Meanwhile, the diner owner Lemuel, fishing by the river, received orders from his superior to retrieve the new film from San Francisco. Juliana visited her mother and stepfather, summoning the courage to tell them about Trudy's death. Her mother, however, refused to accept the reality. Later, Joe found Juliana in a restaurant and urgently asked for her help in obtaining the new film. Juliana then approached Karen about the film, explaining that an East Coast resistance member was seeking it and had ample funds. Karen, skeptical, dismissed Juliana's information, stating that if she needed help from the East Coast, she would contact them directly. Elsewhere, Frank completed the forgery and presented it to Robert, who praised his skill and speed. However, Robert expressed concerns about selling counterfeit items to high-ranking Japanese officials, fearing immediate execution if caught. Unfazed, Frank threatened to expose Robert's involvement in the bullet incident to the Japanese if he refused, forcing Robert to comply. Following his intelligence, Lemuel found Karen to collect the film, only to discover that the contact had been killed and the box was empty. A call from a public phone booth revealed that the film was in the caller's possession, demanding 100000 for it. Elsewhere, a gang leader approached Inspector Kido, claiming to have the sought-after film, but demanding 150000 for it. Recognizing the extortion, Kido refused to deal with the gang leader, who was playing both sides with different prices. John had been increasingly worried about his son, who had been frequently falling and feeling unwell. John took his son to the hospital for a checkup. After an agonizing hour, the doctor emerged and asked to speak with John privately. The doctor revealed that the boy had a severe, untreatable disease and would become a vegetative state within a year. 
Devastated, John wanted a second opinion, but the doctor warned that seeking further medical advice would require legal procedures. He handed John a vial, suggesting euthanasia, as Nazi policy dictated that individuals with incurable diseases or disabilities were not permitted to live. While at work, Juliana received a bouquet of flowers with a note instructing her to meet someone. After her shift, she found Karen, who asked Juliana to arrange a meeting with Joe. John still struggled to accept his son's diagnosis. During this tumultuous period, Himmler, the powerful politician from Berlin, unexpectedly arrived in New York. They discussed the previous attack on John. Noticing that Himmler's coffee came with four sugars, John inquired about Himmler's visit. Himmler candidly stated he was there to detain Rudolf. After Himmler left, John's subordinate, the one who served the coffee, was cleaning up. John remarked that he was aware of Himmler's coffee preferences, but the subordinate explained it was Himmler's adjutant who provided the information, adding that Berlin would also know John's coffee preferences. John praised the subordinate for his attention to detail. Afterward, John visited Rudolf in prison, informing him that Himmler would soon take him away. John mentioned that he could have used torture but refrained, implying Rudolf would face far worse under Himmler. He urged Rudolf to confess his actions so John could help him. Rudolf, prepared for death, spoke of their bloody hands and loyalty to the state. John defended his actions, claiming he killed to protect his family and would do so again. Rudolf advised John against living in his delusions, stating it would not save his family. Juliana and two resistance members, Karen and Lemuel, met with Joe. Karen and Lemuel needed Joe's funds to buy the film from the gang. Joe agreed, assuring them he could provide the money. Robert visited the Japanese businessman's home presenting an art piece. The butler directed Robert to the side entrance, emphasizing it was the businessman's specific instruction. Robert began his sales pitch, but the businessman was skeptical, questioning its authenticity and suggesting some Americans viewed deceiving the Japanese as a victory. As Robert hesitated, the businessman's wife intervened, claiming the necklace had a sinister aura, hinting at its history of sorrow. Robert quickly concocted a story to align with her perception, ultimately convincing the businessman to buy the necklace. After selling the necklace, Robert visited Frank with his share of the profits, proposing they continue their lucrative partnership. However, Frank declined, unwilling to continue the deceit. Juliana and her group planned to trade the film with the gang at their headquarters at 10 p.m. Meanwhile, at home, John was pushing his son through grueling training exercises. John's wife, unaware of her son's illness, felt that John was being too hard on their son. During this tense moment, Joe called John to inform him that he had connected with the resistance, but that the film had been stolen by the gang. To buy it back, they needed 100000 John agreed and transferred the money to Joe. When Juliana returned home, she noticed a policeman outside. Frank explained that the officer had been loitering all afternoon, and his target was Frank himself. They needed to leave immediately, as Ed had already secured tickets for an 11 p.m. bus. Juliana hesitated, emotional about leaving her kind boss, Tagomi. Frank insisted on their departure, allowing Juliana to bid her mother farewell but warning her not to reveal anything. As the time for the film exchange approached, Lemuel volunteered to handle the transaction, but Joe insisted on going himself since it was his money. Lemuel reluctantly agreed. Meanwhile, Juliana was having dinner at her mother's house, knowing it could be a long time before she saw her family again. Her mother, sensing something was off, noticed Juliana's distress as she barely touched her food. After dinner, Juliana's stepfather cautioned her to stay out of trouble, revealing that they had intercepted gang communications about selling the film to the resistance and that Japanese forces planned to ambush them. Realizing Joe and the others were walking into a trap, Juliana rushed out, promising Frank she would make it back in time for the 11 p.m. bus. Joe successfully acquired the film, but Kido was lying in wait. As Joe prepared to leave, Juliana arrived, warning him that it was a trap. They attempted to escape through the back door but were captured by a car at the intersection. Joe and Juliana were taken to a dark room. As the 11 p.m. bus departure approached, Frank anxiously awaited Juliana. Ed urged Frank to leave, stressing it was their last chance, but Frank refused to board the bus without her. In the dark room, Juliana told Joe about their plan to leave San Francisco, lamenting that they had missed the bus. Joe, clearly not wanting Juliana to leave, asked about their destination. Suddenly, a burly man entered and took Juliana away. It turned out that the gang had captured them, and Juliana was released because Karen and Lemuel paid to ransom her. Karen, believing they had already paid 100000 demanded the film. 
The gang leader, however, claimed the money was compensation for the military police raid the previous night, refusing to hand over the film. As Karen and Lemuel prepared to leave, Juliana insisted on taking Joe with them. Sensing her determination, the gang leader demanded an additional 50000 for Joe's release. Karen and Lemuel were at a loss, unable to pay the sum and prioritizing the film's recovery. Nonetheless, Juliana was adamant about rescuing Joe. John found his injured subordinate, who had been attacked previously. John said it's very likely that their attack was orchestrated by Himmler. He handed his subordinate a letter, instructing him to deliver it to Hitler by any means necessary if something happened to him. Meanwhile, Tagomi, who was meditating, was interrupted by Inspector Kido. Kido requested the activity logs of ships arriving from Osaka to San Francisco to crack down on the gang's drug operations. Kido had a vendetta against the gang for humiliating him. Juliana found Frank hiding at Ed's place. She apologized for missing the bus the previous night and informed Frank that they needed 50,000 to save Joe or he would be killed. Frank, frustrated, said that their future depended on that money and suggested letting Joe die. However, Juliana insisted on using the money to save Joe. Seeing no other option, Frank agreed to go and ransom Joe himself. The scene shifted to Himmler, who was treating Rudolph to good food and drink. Himmler revealed that he knew Rudolph had given the Heisenberg device blueprints to the Japanese Minister of Technology. Despite Rudolph's readiness to die, Himmler planned to exploit Hitler's trust in Rudolph, using him to get close to and kill Hitler. Himmler also threatened Rudolph's family, leaving him no choice but to comply. Frank armed himself with a gun, which had only two bullets left, and went to the gang's headquarters to ransom Joe. However, Joe, unaware of the situation, demanded the film from the gang. The gang refused, saying Joe could leave if he wanted to, but not with the film. As they were leaving, Joe noticed Frank's gun. At the door, Joe turned around, took Frank's gun, and shot two gang members, demanding the film from the gang leader. The leader, having no choice, handed over the film. Joe knocked the leader unconscious, securing the film. Frank was furious, saying Joe killed their men and could just walk away, but he still lived here. Joe retorted that he was also planning to leave and handed the gun back to Frank, now empty of bullets. The gang, angry about the deaths, reported to the authorities that the film had been stolen by the East Coast resistance. At Ed's house, Ed's grandfather discovered that Juliana and Frank had committed a crime. Fearing for his grandsons and his own life, the old man demanded that Juliana leave within 10 minutes, threatening to call the police if she didn't. Just then, Frank returned, but they realized they needed identification to buy tickets, so they had to think of another plan. As they were leaving, Ed handed them a few hundred cash, saying they needed the money more than he did, and took the gun, insisting he would handle things. Meanwhile, John found the subordinate who was delivering coffee to Himmler. John invited him to the rooftop for a talk. Everyone knows that rooftop conversations rarely end well. John had discovered that it was actually the subordinate who had provided roots to the resistance intentionally and had killed a resistance member in prison with a spoon. He knew he was working for Himmler and had the privilege to access his roots. John asked if the man knew why Himmler wanted him dead. The man shook his head, genuinely clueless. With a swift move, John pushed him off the rooftop. Juliana and Frank found Joe, but without tickets, they had to rely on him to get out of the city. However, the Japanese had Joe's information and were actively searching for him. A Japanese officer noticed them, prompting Joe to hand the film to Juliana before they split up to escape. Elsewhere, a general met with Tagomi, expressing concerns about their strategic disadvantage against the Nazis due to the lack of nuclear weapons. However, the Minister of Technology had found a microfilm in his pocket containing crucial technical data. Tagomi saw this as an opportunity to develop their own nuclear weapons and level the playing field with the Nazis. However, the general seemed irrational, wanting to wage war against Germany, a move Tagomi and Rudolf never intended. In New York, John received a call from Joe, who informed him that he had the film but had killed two gang members, attracting police attention. Joe needed help to escape the city and wanted to bring two friends along. However, John was unwilling to help Juliana and warned Joe that he would kill her if they met again. The gang leader confronted Inspector Kido, accusing him of seizing heroin at the docks as an act of revenge. To prove his loyalty, the gang leader provided information about the real shooter, a Nazi assassin. He warned that if people found out the Nazis had fired at the Crown Prince, it would be considered an act of war and Japan was not ready to defeat Germany. John returned home to find Himmler waiting for him. Himmler mentioned learning about the subordinate's death that afternoon. Both men knew the real story, but didn't address it openly. Himmler then invited John to go hunting in the morning. 
John agreed, knowing that this hunt would be a deadly showdown. Juliana and Frank waited for Joe at the school, passing the time by watching the new film. In the film, San Francisco was nuked by the Nazis, and Frank, as a resistance fighter, was killed by a Nazi, who turned out to be Joe. The revelation shocked Juliana and Frank. After watching the film, Juliana and Frank were still in shock when Joe arrived. Unaware of the film's content, Joe faced a hostile Frank who now believed Joe was a Nazi. Frank refused to give Joe the film, leading to a physical fight. Frank cursed Joe, calling him a Nazi bastard. Juliana demanded to know if Joe was indeed a Nazi. Joe did not deny it, took the film, and walked out. John was preparing his guns for the hunting trip with Himmler. Before leaving, he handed his wife a handgun and told her not to let Himmler near the children if he didn't come back. Afterward, Juliana and Frank found Karen and Lemuel explaining the content of the film and asking for help to leave the city. Karen agreed, but set a condition. Juliana had to retrieve the film and kill Joe. Juliana couldn't bring herself to kill Joe, so Lemuel suggested that she lure Joe to him and he would handle the rest. Juliana reluctantly agreed. Inspector Kido, following the gang's information, found the real shooter who had targeted the crown prince. The assassin was indeed a Nazi. When Kido's men found the murder weapon, the assassin expressed his willingness to cooperate and confess with a smile, clearly having a hidden agenda. Without letting him say more, Kido shot him dead, knowing that public knowledge of a Nazi attempt on the crown prince's life would provoke a war that Japan couldn't win. He then instructed his men to keep this information secret. His subordinate mentioned that they were still pursuing Frank, and witnesses confirmed that Frank hadn't fired a shot. If they couldn't capture Frank, reporting the real culprit to Tokyo would not be satisfactory, and Kido would have to kill himself. Kido, however, was prepared for this fate. Joe sought asylum at the German embassy. The staff inquired about his mission's status, but Joe remained tight-lipped. Meanwhile, Kido confronted Tagomi, revealing that he knew about Tagomi's assistance in Rudolph's escape and understood the reasons behind it. Kido hadn't exposed Tagomi because he was also committed to protecting the nation. Tagomi bowed to Kido in respect. At the factory, Ed attempted to dispose of the handgun but was caught by his supervisor. Recognizing the gun as the one the Kempeitai were searching for, the supervisor called the authorities. Meanwhile, Rudolf, aware of his likely one-way mission to assassinate Hitler, bid a final farewell to his family. He lamented that being a good person was increasingly difficult and ambiguous with age, but emphasized the growing importance of striving to be one. Kido, unable to present the real assassin, prepared for suicide. Just then, his subordinate brought Frank's gun. At the German embassy, Joe received a call from New York. John's subordinate informed him that the embassy had not notified New York about Joe's presence. It turned out that the embassy agent reported directly to Himmler and intended to avoid notifying others. The agent approached Joe, informing him that a car was ready to take him to the airport and directed him to the basement. Meanwhile, Juliana, under the pretense of processing a visa, also entered the German embassy. Joe reached the basement and saw two men preparing for an interrogation, realizing they planned to torture him. He sneaked back upstairs, where he encountered Juliana. Juliana confessed that the resistance had sent her to lure and kill Joe. She also mentioned the film showing Joe in a Nazi uniform executing many people. Joe argued that he wasn't that person, explaining that the film Juliana saw was a propaganda piece made for Stalin in 1954, who had been executed in 1949. Hence, the film's authenticity was as questionable as the idea of Stalin coming back to life. Inspector Kido interrogated Ed, asking if the gun was his. To protect Frank, Ed took the blame, claiming the gun was his and shouldering the burden. The scene shifts to John and Himmler discussing the films. Himmler inquired about the progress in finding the film. John stated that he couldn't disclose that information. Himmler's subordinate then pointed a gun at John, revealing Rudolph's mission to assassinate Hitler and demanding John choose a side before the call came in. John asked Himmler who else was behind this since such a major plot couldn't have been orchestrated by him alone. Meanwhile, Rudolph arrived at Hitler's retirement home. Hitler was watching a film depicting the fall of Berlin. Rudolph pointed a gun at Hitler, who turned and said he knew Himmler sent someone to kill him. If he's dead, whoever succeeds him will wage war against Japan, and the assassin will be branded a historical criminal, responsible for the assassination or the attack, bringing shame to his family. Rudolph replied he knew his sins were his own, but Hitler retorted that his only sin is his weakness and urged him to choose to die honorably. Eventually, Rudolph shot himself, unwilling to become a historical criminal. 
Back with John, the phone rang. Himmler asked one last time if John would stand with him. The gunman behind John was ready to shoot. John shook his head. Himmler answered the call, but it was Hitler on the other end. Just then, the gunman behind John was shot by one of John's men, who had been strategically placed. John quickly grabbed his gun and shot at Himmler. On the other side, Juliana led Joe to the docks as planned, where Karen and Lemuel had set up an ambush. But at the last moment, Juliana changed her mind, saying she didn't believe in that bullshit film, and she chose to believe in Joe. After that, she helped Joe board a cargo ship bound for Mexico. Frank learned that Ed had been arrested and confronted Kido, offering himself up. Kido, however, didn't need the truth but a scapegoat. Meanwhile, Tagomi walked alone through the streets of San Francisco, found a quiet spot, and sat down. He clutched Juliana's necklace and began to meditate. Upon opening his eyes, he found himself in a parallel world, the land of free America. A newspaper beside him reported on the U.S. military blockade of Cuba. With that, season one of this drama concludes.